Namaste and greetings. I, Mahima Kapoor, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, welcome you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a distinguished lecture on comprehensive data governance, evolution, challenges, and the way forward for policy under the series, the state of statistics, hashtag data discourses. This talk is being organized by the IMPRI Generation Alpha Data Center and delivered by Professor Susan Ariel Aronson. I am honored to introduce the speaker for the session, Professor Susan Ariel Aronson. Ma'am is a research professor of international affairs and director of the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub. She conceived of and directs the hub, which aims to educate policymakers, the press, and the public about domestic and international data governance issues from digital trade to public data governance. Ma'am is also a cross disciplinary fellow and affiliate at GWU's Institute for International Economic Policy, the Institute for Science and Technology Policy, and the SIGUR Center. She is also a senior fellow at the Think Tank Center for International Governance Innovation in Canada, where she publishes much of her research. Mom is currently directing projects on mapping data governance and writing on comparative advantage in data, trade as a tool to counter disinformation, data and national security, and America's approach to stimulating AI. Her research has been funded by the Helluit, MacArthur, Coach, Ford, and Rockefeller Foundations, governments such as the Netherlands, USA, and Canada, the UN, ILO, and World Bank, and US corporations, including Ford Motor and Levi Strauss. Dr. Arison is a frequent speaker and writer on international economic developments. She regularly writes op-eds for Barron's. Mom has commented, on economics on marketplace, all things considered, morning edition. Previously, she was a guest scholar in economics at the Brookings Institution and a research fellow at the World Trade Institute. Mom was also the Carvello Fellow at the Government Accountability Project and the Minerva Chair at the National War College. GWU is a member of the Public Interest Technology Network and as the designated representative, she works to encourage education and research that facilitates public understanding of technology and technology that serves the public. She's a member of the Advisory Board for Human Rights Under Pressure and the Advisory Board of Business and Human Rights. In recent years, she has been a pro bono advisor to the UN Special Representative on Transnational Corporations and Human Rights and the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. She is also consulted for the ICO, ILO, the World Bank, Free the Slaves, the Ford Foundation, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the Progressive Policy Institute, the Stanley Foundation, and other several organizations, along with governments of Canada, Belgium, and the Netherlands, among others. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good Before, evening. Sorry. Good evening to you as well. Good evening. I, I welcome this opportunity to present what we call work in progress. So it looks like since I'm, uh, it looks like we, we should have Dr. Kumar uh, share the screen. So if we can start with the second slide, that would be great. I would love to get your feedback on this project. And what we're trying to do, it's, it's actually not allowing me to get to my screen. So what we'd like to do is hey, um, get a better understanding of what- I'm bringing, right? yeah, I'm bringing that on screen. Meanwhile, my okay. mom can also introduce okay. to Yeah. Sure, sir. So. We are also fortunate to have Ms. Urvishi Prasad as the discussant for the session. Ma'am is the director at Development 
Monitoring and Evaluation Office, Niti Ayo. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to hand over the proceedings to Professor Susan Ariel Aronson for her distinguished lecture. And we certainly look forward to a learning experience from her. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, I really welcome your questions and comments on this, because as I said, this is a work in progress. So what do we know about data governance? You know, policymakers talk all the time about the importance of data, but it's really hard to govern data. You know, they policymakers know how to govern statistical data and proprietary data, such as trade secrets, right? They've been doing that for a long time. And certainly policymakers have collected all sorts of personal data and uh, data about society. But how do you govern all these different types of data in a transparent, equitable and accountable manner. That's really difficult. So data governance, there isn't yet a consensus on what we're talking about. So I'm gonna use the OECD's definition, which is the OECD defines data governance as principles, policies, standards, laws, regulations and agreements designed to control, manage, share, protect and extract value from different types of data. But there's so much that we don't know. So here's some of the questions. What types of policies, processes, and outcomes can sustain trust among data users and producers? How can we encourage data mixing and data sharing among public entities, private entities, between users, between business and government? while effectively protecting individuals and groups. Can data truly be sovereign? And if so, what individuals and groups are sovereign over data? What does effective data governance look like, which is not the same as good governance, right? Because we no one knows what that is. Does effective data governance correlate with other forms of good governance? Does effective data governance correlate with income? Are there regional approaches to data governance regarding beyond rules regarding personal data? Do international agreements regulating cross-border data flows build trust in data governance? So originally we took a questionnaire that had been designed by the World Bank for the World Development Report. And um, we added to that questionnaire and we did a death study which focused on hard law, rules, regulations, and laws in 52 countries. And we looked at the national and international level. But the questionnaire approach had a lot of problems. For example, it didn't include soft and hard law. And as example of soft law, we looked at countries' visions, like what did they wanna do? Um, how do they see a particular technology and its use of data? It also didn't discuss trust and it didn't allow us to look at the feedback loop. So we decided maybe we should take a different approach. And what we decided to do was to examine what we thought were the components of good governance. Excuse me, I misspoke. What of comprehensive governance. And so we had two parts of this. We wanted to think very broadly and then more specifically onto sub attributes. So let's dig into that. So first strategic. So we looked to see if countries had plans for the different contexts of data use and reuse. So examples of that are does the country have a data strategy? Does the country have a public administration data strategy? Does it have guidelines on private sector data sharing? So to encourage, let's say, large companies to share data with smaller companies. And does it have an AI strategy? Originally, we had a lot more uh, strategies such as smart manufacturing strategies, but many nations didn't have that. 
Then we looked at the regulatory, which is essentially what we did in the original questionnaire. So what is the legal regime? So does it have a personal data protection law? Does it have an open data law? Does it have a Freedom of Information Act? So again, here's that feedback loop. Does it have a legal right to be protected from automated decision-making and a legal right to data portability? Then we looked at what we call responsible data governance, which is, was there evidence that the country thinks about the ethical trust and human rights implications of data use and reuse? So these are things like a digital charter, which the UK and Canada have. And the, that is, again, the government says, here are our responsibilities to our citizens. Is there a data ethics framework for the public sector? Is there an AI ethics framework? And is there a trust framework? Then we looked to see um, in sort of a Chandlerian model, right? Because Alfred Chandler looked at how big corporations change over time. We wanted to look at how is government changing? So were institutional structures changing? And so, for example, was there an online portal for the release of government open data? Was there a data protection body? Was there an open data body? A public sector data governance body? And was there an international data affairs body? So I just, just to go into more detail, for example, Denmark has a data ambassador, uh, an ambassador to the tech sector. Um, the U.S. has digital trade attaches. Uh, so governments we saw were really changing structurally in terms of new jobs that went beyond just statistical agencies. And then we looked at feedback loops. So were there consultations um, and who participated in these consultations related to data use? and various types of data. And then we looked at the international. Uh, so does the government participate in international efforts to establish data governance rules? So here we looked at Convention 108. Convention 108 relates to personal data. We looked to the Open Government Partnership, which is a set of rules and, and uh, countries monitor each other regarding their commitments to keep data open. Then we looked at the OECD AI principles, and then of course, trade agreements. And here we looked at binding provisions on cross-border data flows. So I just wanna give you a sense of where we found governments. We do not wanna do a beauty contest because government's changing in this area all the time. Um, and also, um, I think these metrics send the wrong signals to governments. But that said, the United Kingdom was the country that had more aspects of data governance. So we're not saying it's good, we don't know. But the United Kingdom had put in more of these attributes than any other nation that we found. And we thought that was quite important. And here, this, this these radar charts compare other countries and where they're at. So you can get a sense of it. Um, and so just to give you more feedback on this, you know, this is the specifics of what the United Kingdom has been doing regarding what we call strategic. Here's regulatory. This, I think, kind of shows why the United Kingdom is ahead of many other countries. It has done so much in this area. So these are examples of that. Um, here's India. So I hope you'll correct us if we got this wrong. Here again is India and regulatory. So the bill, personal data protection bill is pending.
Okay. So we write not found because we are doing a death study. We do try to speak to experts, but um, you know, we're not saying India doesn't have this, but we found no evidence of it. Okay. So again, this is not a beauty contest, but I wanted to give you a sense of the 52 countries and where they came out based on our composite scores. And you know, it's interesting to say, to see that there, there's a lot of geographic diversity, diversity here in terms of the countries that are leading. And here are some of the countries with lower composite scores. I want to also give you a sense of convergence and divergence. So we found the largest number of countries had a Freedom of Information Act. Many had an open data portal. We were not surprised to see how many had a AI strategy, but I'm surprised at how low uh, 37 out of 52 had a data protection body. So that's still quite a work in progress. All right, so here's the takeaways. First, nobody knows what comprehensive or effective data governance looks like. So this is a first iteration, which is why we are trying so hard to get feedback on this. And if we're moving in this direction, you would think that industrialized countries or countries with strong data-driven economies will be doing something to help other countries do data governance, but no one knows what good data governance looks like. Thirdly, policymakers are just beginning to think about the spillover effects of data governance on their economy and on other policy goals. And I just cite as example what we saw in the United States when um, Donald Trump, when he was president, uh, started going after TikTok, which totally undermined um, how the United States has long viewed uh, few free flow of data. And um, he was about to ban that app until he was stopped by the courts. Okay, in terms of convergence, we saw a lot of convergence in personal data rules governing the private sector, but lots of governments have policy space or there are no rules governing the public sector's use of personal data. We saw a major convergence on public data governance, on proprietary data governance, some convergence, and then significant convergence in trade agreements governing cross-border data flows. But we have a lot of questions that we wanna ask and try to answer from this data. So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to add countries and indicators. We're, we are about, I would say in the next week, we will have our website online. We will analyze the results and compare it along regional income and other groupings. And we want to build on this feedback mechanisms, because one thing I can tell you is that we found very few governments that said, OK, we heard from our people regarding our AI strategy, and we've proposed some regulations and laws. But they didn't say how they use public comment. So that feedback loop is pretty incomplete. So that's where we're at. And thank you so much for hearing me out. And I look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, so now I would like to invite uh, Urvashi, ma'am, for her remarks. And if you could also see, take the questions that have been raised by Professor and uh, attempt to answer those from the Indian context. Urvashi, ma'am, over to you. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so yes, I think firstly, thank you, uh, Professor, for the presentation. It was uh, really uh, interesting. And um, I think this is such a, a critical uh, space and yet such a complex one, uh, as, as, as you rightly um, uh, highlighted. So I think I'll just speak of, you know, a few uh, uh, high level uh, sort of issues and challenges from the Indian perspective and also some of the major initiatives that we are actually undertaking to try and address um, some of uh, the issues that uh, you spoke about. So I think uh, data firstly, um, in a structure like ours, obviously such a large and diverse country with governments at multiple levels, um, not just the central government, but also the state governments, and then the sub-state uh, level governments uh, at the district level, at the block level. Um, there is there is a vast amount of data that is that is actually being collected uh, on various programs, various government programs, um, various other types of private sector initiatives, um, development organizations. Um, so there's I think there's a huge volume of data, especially in, in certain sectors. In certain sectors, yes, um, even the amount of data we are collecting um, might not be as much, but uh, certainly in many other sectors, we actually have a lot of data. So I think that data richness is something that uh, obviously in a context like ours um, is, is, is a strength. Now, the biggest challenges for us are um, how do we actually streamline the collection of this data? How frequently do we go about collecting this data? Because a, lo a lot of our large surveys, the census of course um, happens once in 10 years. A lot of our other large surveys, whether in the health sector uh, or otherwise have so far been um, at, at a fairly considerable gap of you know five years or 10 years. So that is one big issue for us that how do we address this whole question of periodicity? Um, and of course it differs for different sectors, um, but we do need data to come in much more regularly. Um, and of course now in, in many cases, we are also moving towards, uh, you know, almost a real time data collection using technology and other tools that are now increasingly becoming available to us. Um, but at least, you know, if, if it is a process level indicator or an output, uh, we should be getting data on that almost on a real time basis so that we can take the necessary decisions that we need to take. Otherwise we are waiting for you know several years before we are actually uh, actioning something. So, um, so I think periodicity is one big question, one big challenge for us. Uh, how do we go about it? How do we think about it? How do we organize it? Um, the process of data collection. So I mentioned technology and you know a lot of technologies are uh, emerging and more and more getting used uh, in the public policy space as well. Um, but again, how do we actually take this right down to our lowest levels, um, or, you know, at the district, at the block level, because it's not just about doing something uh, sitting in New Delhi, but it's about doing it, you know, in a way that works for all of India and works in, you know, all the different uh, challenging contexts across the country. So that is, I think, really, you know, whether it is a technology like AI or whether it's big data, um, Niti Aayog, in fact, where, where I work, uh, we actually work a lot on these emerging technologies or frontier technologies. Um, but our biggest challenge is how do we actually um, take it down to the absolute grassroots level and, and take it down to the last mile and, and the last person, because you know it's not something that should remain limited to a big city or our metros. It is something which needs to work across the country. So that is the other piece of it. How do we actually go about collecting this data? How do we use technology to streamline it? Um, then a very, very other, very critical part is once Assuming we have this data, we have it at regular uh, intervals, or we have it at a fairly good periodicity, how do we actually use it for governance and decision making? And that, to my mind, is actually, you know, perhaps the biggest challenge. Um, because, you know, even if we have all this data, um, there is a, a lot of 
work that we need to do at different levels of our government and implementation system to get buy-in from stakeholders at different levels. Then why are we collecting this data? What is the purpose? What actions are we taking based on it? Um, and also that data should not be viewed as something negative because sometimes um, people are a little hesitant or reluctant because they feel that you know data might be used to show where you are lacking or where you are lagging behind. So it sort of becomes like a fault finding exercise. So we also need to change this mindset uh, to say that you know it's not a fault finding exercise really, but it's to say that, okay, here are the areas where we're doing well, here we need to do much better. Um, so I think bringing in that mindset, it sounds quite basic and fundamental, um, but I think that is really perhaps one of the biggest challenges is making sure that everybody in the system is, is actually on board with why we are even investing in all this and why are we even undertaking this massive effort uh, to be collecting you know, all this data that we are. So I think that is another very big um, question for us. And the other aspect that, that you also mentioned and, and you uh, asked about that upfront as well in terms of the data privacy. And I think in, especially in, in sectors like health, that's a sector that I uh, work in uh, and I've worked in for several years, that is absolutely fundamental because you know we cannot um, uh, be sharing data without the right sort of protocols uh, in terms of privacy, in terms of security of the data, in terms of informed consent uh, of the person whose data we are actually, you know, using or, or is being shared. So uh, we had actually uh, put out uh, uh, a, a discussion document and it's, it's sort of now evolving into a framework. Um, addressing all these different aspects. So, you know, it's, 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 it's looking at the entire data architecture. Um, in the health sector. And of course, we've also now tried to broaden uh, the ambit of that and say that, you know, we need to look at other sectors as well. Um, to say that apart from addressing all these issues that I mentioned of, you know, data collection, the process, the use, um, and how do we do governance with that data? How do we actually address these very fundamental issues um, of data security, privacy, uh, and informed consent, because again, uh, you know, a lot of the population, it's at different levels of, um, of, of literacy or different levels of being able to understand uh, why we are doing something. So we need to make sure that, um, you know, given this kind of structure where there are inherent inequities, how are we addressing this challenge uh, in this situation, I think becomes, becomes the biggest question. So we've certainly started to put a lot of thought into these issues. Uh, we've started to share, you know, frameworks and, you know, just our ideas and concepts around this. Of course, you know, the ministries, the state governments, the private sector, you know, these are all stakeholders. So eventually we will need everyone to really be coming on board and be aligned with what we're saying. But at least we're trying to put out, you know, some of the thinking and frameworks around this so that we can have a serious uh, discussion on how do we actually uh, take this forward. And, and I think we're also, you know, related to what I said about the different stakeholders, um, the private sector, you know, again, if I come back to the example of the health sector in India, um, a very large part of health services are actually delivered by the private sector and much of the private sector is actually not organized. Uh, these might be smaller establishments, you know, these might be one to two bedded uh, clinics or, you know, so much smaller, not very organized, um, and yet, you know, you do have people going there, you have patients going there, you have people availing services. So how do we really bring everybody into this network? Uh, only then we can actually comprehensively capture all the data uh, and bring in the interlinkages that we're talking about. You know, a lot of it is we want one data system to be able to talk to the other, um, but we can't really do this unless we have uh, this integration uh, not just within the government, but also outside the government when you when you have private sector, which has access to a lot of data, uh, you have other types of uh, organizations which, which would be having access to it as well. So I think this is again something which um, needs a lot of thought because there's obviously a lot of sensitivities around how we do this integration as well and the whole public versus private um, challenges as well here. So I think that is also something we're trying to do. Um, just finally, I would say that 
uh, we've actually been working on a big initiative. It's, it's called the National Data Analytics um, Platform, and, and we're actually targeting for a release um, next year. And what this platform aims to do is, is actually address at least some of the challenges that I was talking about, um, is to say that whatever existing data we have in the government system from different schemes, different programs at different levels, uh, can we at least integrate that um, and look at that sectorally, you know, so health data is actually uh, probably stored in many different IT systems uh, across the country for different programs. Can we at least integrate all of that as a first step and start to do some analytics on it, start to see that what are we really learning, you know, from all this volume of data that, that we've got sitting here. So this data analytics uh, platform should uh, hopefully be launched uh, next year. Of course, we would be um, using a, you know, a lot of technology here so that it will certainly leverage technology. But I think the whole idea is to move towards uh, data-led and database governance much more uh, and make it a much more integral part of our policy making um, rather than just having it as, you know, something on the side or, you know, like a fault finding exercise, as I was saying, but make it really very integral to every stage of, of, of our policy making and governance process. So um, that is something also that we are undertaking. So I'll just, um, I'll just stop here. I just wanted to share some of these, um, you know, high level issues, challenges, as well as some of the initiatives um, we're undertaking on this. Thank you. Great. Mr. Susan, would you like to uh, comment on any of the of that? No, it's good to know what's happening in India. Be, you know, uh, that that's really fantastic. And um, we hope to reflect these changes. We'll be updating the metrics every six months. So we hope to reflect these changes. And, you know, India is so fascinating in terms of its power regarding data. Right. Uh, we have some questions which have also came. Uh, so I'll just uh, take up the first very simple one raised by Vashvi Goel. Uh, may I request Professor to define convergence in terms of your analysis or how you are moving? And since many of the nations are also going and countries going digital now, especially after the pandemic, uh, how do you see uh, what are the convergence elements in your view? So when we say convergence, we mean convergence in the type of policies, you know, do they have a data protection agency, right? Um, do they have a law uh, governing uh, the use of automatic decision-making, that kind of thing. And so divergence would be, you know, differences in countries uh, regarding these, uh, the, the metric in terms of the specific aspects of the metric. Right, thank you. Uh, one thing which was also highlighted, I thought also to bring that, uh, was uh, the countries having, for example, UK, uh, which has more of regulatory framework are, or their models are also being the best practice. Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, United States does not have that much of regulation. Do you think there is an equilibrium or any say regarding how much regulation should be, especially in this field? I don't know that yet, right? Um... But here's something that I think is really important. So far, this is just anecdotal evidence, right? The countries that are leading the digital economy, at least the countries that have the largest private sector built on the analysis of data are not the countries that have the most comprehensive approach to data governance. And that's not surprising to me logically, right? Because countries are trying to both stimulate it and regulate these over these huge global companies. So one has to wonder if the United States is not captured by these companies. I personally find it very offensive that almost, if you watch news in the United States, you are inevitably going to see a Facebook ad. And Facebook says how it really thinks it's time for internet regulation or data governance regulation. But 
you know, honestly, Facebook is one of the major factors impeding data governance regulation. Why? Because policymakers are captured. So, um, you know, it's a it's an interesting phenomenon. Okay. Uh I would also bring another factor. How do you see the role of AI, blockchain, or other technologies uh, enabling data analysis and mining, uh, helping towards uh, going forward in the governance sector? Because we have China, Korea, other nations also. And now as the tech becoming you know, more and more uh, active share in our economy, uh, recent incidents also, how do you see technology leading this change or driving this change? Or is it still a, a distant thing we are talking about? Well, I mean, lots of governments use AI to make decisions, right? I think we have to be very uh, clear about what we're talking about. So I, I know nothing about blockchain and I, I'm not familiar with governments beyond Estonia uh, Finland, uh, and I forgot what other partner is in that group that uses blockchain for government websites. But, um, and that's something actually that we should be thinking about. But um, regarding AI, nations have very different attitudes towards AI and different uses of AI and different regulations of AI. And uh, we're trying very hard to reflect that diversity but I would say the bulk of nations have no regulations on AI. I don't, we don't have any overview right now of government's use of AI and government's regulation of government's use of AI. In general, these regulations right now apply to both the public and the private sector. It's use of automated decision-making for decisions such as, for example, sentencing for criminals. Right, Simi, you have a question? Uh, yes, yes. So thank you, Professor Susan, for your wonderful lecture. And uh, actually my question really stems from, uh, from the recent documentary, the Netflix documentary that you might have watched on the hack. And um, uh, it really shows the brutal and extractive nature of data mining companies that exploit the personal data points of individual citizens. Uh, and they also say that the data is the most powerful asset on the earth. Um, in fact, it is a trillion dollar uh, economy, a trillion dollar per day economy, and it has taken over oil. So could you share your views on whether personal data should be a fundamental right? Because this is a question that really affects us all, or at least, um, there is some recommendation that it be incorporated into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, I'll also, yeah, uh, so this, if this question you could uh, take. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, well, there's a lot of questions packed into that question. And I wrote a piece um, called Data is Different. And it was an analysis in 2018. And it was an analysis of how we think about data and use various metaphors. I'm deeply uncomfortable with any metaphor that describes data as the new oil or a resource, right? Because that is um, fundamentally uh, contradictory to the role of data in the economy, right? It's not something that we're gonna get rid of. So I think we need to be very careful, is data labor, right? And, you know, because it is us, and I'm only here talking about personal data, these metaphors is data infrastructure, such as you know, in use of statistics, that we need to be very careful what type of data we're talking about and how it is used. Now let's get to your question about the documentary, The Hack. I did not see the documentary, but um, I am very familiar with uh, what I think is the misuse of personal data, not through data mining per se, which is a tactic, but through, um, look, firms should try their best to understand their customers. But when firms such as Facebook take advantage of their customers to manipulate them, that to me, whether it's politically or economically, and we see this more and more, that to me is behavior that should be banned. But will it be banned? No, because we have built a very powerful 
data-driven economy that is built on two things, personal data and the mixing of personal and proprietary data, right? So when a firm uses its own AI to analyze uh, groups of people, that becomes proprietary data and then they can reuse it constantly. So the next question is, is personal data, is the protection of personal data a human right? And so like other um, human rights, I, I get a little, so my background is in trade and human rights. That's how I came to this. Um, and uh, I think there is a real misunderstanding in international law as to how data is represented. You know, no trade agreement, until recently, no trade agreement discussed data. Now they discuss the free flow of data and they talk about privacy, which is an exception. But data can affect not just privacy, but it can affect freedom of expression, uh, the right to organize and collectively bargain online, freedom of association. So there are many rights that intersect with data protection. And I think we are moving in this direction. But I also believe that nations are not there yet. So you see it with those rights and responsibilities of governments and entities related to personal data, but um, that is not in effect yet because not enough governments have signed on to it. But we're starting to see this. Some nations have established uh, rights to uh, data protection in their constitutions or in national law, but we're in just the beginning phases of this. But um, I notice, um, Moon Young Kim asked a question about how we measure change. And this is an example that we could use to talk about how we measure change. We are trying to date these laws and regulations and strategies and see who's leading the process, which governments are leading the process, and how it disperses over the world over time. And to me, the right to personal data, to control of your personal data, is an example of a human right that does seem to be um, spreading around the world. Um, it's interesting that it is not spread in those countries. I mean, there is a lot of work in China regarding private sector misuse and use of personal data, but those regulations do not apply to the government's use and misuse of personal data. And that is why we separate out those two things. And that right will never be complete unless governments are also held to account for their use and misuse of personal data. Sorry for that long-winded answer. No, no issues. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so ma'am, would you like to take this question uh, from uh, Yoon Young Kim or uh, is, is the explanation uh, covered in, in this previous uh, discussion that you just had? About yeah, that's why I, okay. I tried to answer it in that way. Sure. Um, but another example of this might be, um, so thinking about data sharing and data mixing. So right now, the EU as example has uh, a law um, that it's, it's, it's considering a law regarding data sharing. And the idea is to encourage various types of entities to share their data, which could be fabulous. A lot of private sector data could help governments solve wicked problems, right? Related to um, climate change, as example. But governments and many governments and many proprietary firms hoard their data. So how do you encourage them to share their data, which could be various types of data in a trusted way? And that to me seems something that, you know, governments are wrestling with, with the notion of data fiduciaries. How do you do this in a way that you preserve anonymity uh, but you protect personal data and proprietary data and no one has a clear answer. So we're 
we're trying to map this over time as well to see, okay, which ideas, you know, who's got these ideas, which countries are moving these forward and um, spread around the world. But I don't have any answers to that yet. Right, let me also, yeah, pose uh, another question. Ma'am, when we talk also about uh, countries' data, uh, many, we discuss about the quality and privacy this part. There are also uh, some data discrepancies from the official data also, be it China or be it any government. Uh, uh, there is, the quality check becomes really important, especially for the program data and looking at the transparency and reporting part. Uh, countries also do all kind of things. Are you also looking into any this kind of quality control object or process data or to see what the efficacy of the rule is of uh, all the metrics which you have chosen over time? Something on implementation, efficacy or quality check. Are you also considering that in your metrics? No, because um, <laughs> two reasons. First, um, I do feel very strongly against perception metrics. So coming from work on trade and human rights, most of the human rights metrics are expert perceptions, right? They, they are not a mix of expert perceptions, right? Do you have the right to freedom of association in India? And survey data, where you would ask Indian workers, do you believe that you have the right to freedom of association and all of its incompatibilities? I don't want us to be doing a metric that says India is doing great on this because I have no idea. The only way I could find that out is Indian people, right? And surveys are very, very expensive. And um, I ju we just can't do that in a cost efficient way. Um, I also do not think you know, any government really has this right. So I don't know, we cannot measure the quality. Um, all we can measure is what our government's doing and how comprehensive is it. But comprehensive is not a synonym for effective or good. And, you know, that's a danger with our metric. Because again, I'm not saying that in uh, England, the United Kingdom, um, with its, you know, doing so much better just because it has all these laws in place. We don't know how effective they are. And we don't know how happy the Indian, the, um, the British people are with them. Uh, that's something for someone else to measure. But I do think it's way too early in terms of data. Because as I said, that's why I began this presentation. And tell me what you think. I, you know, I certainly don't have the answers. I really want to hear from other people what they think. You know, I have no idea what effective data governance is going to look like, but I, I have a sense of what those components could look like over time. But, you know, the data-driven economy is so in its infancy. And yet we know certain things are really wrong that none of us have addressed. I mean, honestly, um, you guys talked about data mining. And data mining has been going on since day one of human existence. The, the difference is that it has become so widespread and so automated, right? So we can't ban data mining, but we can ban surveillance capitalism. We can ban, ban various misuse of it. But is that effective data governance? It's going to take time to evaluate. What do you all think? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? No, I think uh, it's important because uh, the whole economy and confidence relies on that. So we see a lot of uh, event and everything happening just because of perception, especially for the economics in our part of the world. Uh, th that plays a major role for investment and for year-to-year -year activities. Perception in the economy, not for the data governance part. Yeah, and but how can we compare? Oh, sorry, go ahead. That's okay, that's okay. Please go ahead. 
Well, I was thinking, you know, like India really has a very clear position on data internationally. Well, you know, it says data should be sovereign. I'm not sure I really get what that means because I think if we really care about sovereign data, we would have the strong, all personal data is an expression of our, our humanity, who we are, right? Okay, but we're talking about all different types of data, right? So India says its data should be sovereign. And a country with 1.2 billion per people has lots of leverage over other uh, huge global firms. But Nigeria with, I, I don't know how many people, but let's say 230 million people does not have that leverage. And so, you know, a lot of people look to India and what it, it's, its governance of data and want to copy it. And I don't know if it's effective. If it's comprehensive, I have, you know, India can do and China can do is just so different from what Canada can do. So I, I want us to be very, very careful, you know, in terms of what we can say, just because like I look I do a lot of work with the Canadian government and I look at what Canada says its policies are. And like Canada is a hotbed for AI and hence a hotbed for, um, and you know, and it has many are, but, or Brazilian firms are in terms of data, but you know, Canada, doesn't seem able to make its data governance policy you yield digital economy results, but India can. So it's really hard to compare countries. What do you think? I interrupted you. I think we can have a response from Urvashi ma'am towards this uh, question. Ma'am, what do you think Urvashi ma'am? Could you repeat what exactly is the question again? How India can leverage uh, the data governance architecture into being a, a, a thriving digital economy as compared with other countries. We also have this example of a modular open source identity platform, MOSIP, uh, which is also linked to Aadhaar. Also, we have COVID. Many other countries are also interested in Africa, e East Asia also. So mm -hmm. things done. And our software workforce, of course, IT. Yeah, I think data governance really, I mean, I sort of, like I was saying initially also, like I think of it uh, much more uh, sort of broadly and, and actually beyond um, the technology or the digital um, platforms per se, I think those are enablers. Those are very important enablers. Um, but eventually it is about getting the whole system right, right? I mean, even though we have COVID, um, we like, you know, we can still have a lot of challenges with COVID, right? And we have faced those and, you know, we try to make the course corrections, etc. cetera. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say, and that's what I said earlier also, that, um, it's, it's less, at least for me, about the precise technology or, um, you know, digital. Uh, I know these are all very buzzwords and very fancy uh, sort of things to talk about. But, and, and I think, you know, it's not just that. There's certainly value to them. They can, they can certainly add a lot of value. They can, as I was saying, help you streamline, help you structure, help you, uh, you know, really strengthen a lot of your uh, data work. Um, but I think we still are very much grappling with the fundamentals um, and I think till we have those fundamentals in place um, you know which I said that you know who's going to collect the data how often uh, why um, how is it going to be stored you know is it is it someone's uh, personal data do we have informed consent do we have all stakeholders on board I think we're still trying to grapple with and address all these sort of basics so I think it's only once we have um, these you know, more in place, 
um, can we truly say that, you know, yes, these technologies can, you know, further uh, play this sort of role or can really provide a fillip to all of this. So, um, yeah, I mean, I know these are like big words and that's why I'm deliberately trying to use much simpler words because I think our problems are much more fundamental. Our challenges are much more fundamental. Um, uh, and I think we also in the technologies, we can't get lost and forget about the behavioral parts and the, the fact that there's, you know, there's human beings, right, who are actually using these technologies and who are also the beneficiaries of, of the technologies yeah. or should be. So I think we can't forget that part also. Uh, in fact, that's very, very critical uh, in, in a structure, you know, like this. And, and as I said, a system as diverse and complex as, as ours. So, so I think, yeah, I think we need to really first focus on some of these basics, uh, which is what we're at least trying to do and trying to, you know, sort of have more conversations around these at the highest levels uh, in policy making. Um, and then see how do we use these tools and technologies as, as enablers to allow us to do all this. But the discussion should not become centered on these, you know, while we still don't have the other basics in place. So I don't know if, if it's making sense, but um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm just trying to say that we first need to have our fundamentals of the data system, architecture, you know, how, what, where, when, you know, answer all these basic questions um, and then see where we use these technologies, where we use these platforms as enablers um, for this whole uh, system. So, yeah, I think that's really what my view is on this. Sure. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, yeah, I think there is no one uh, single straight uh, response that would happen. I think um, deliberations like these would uh, and brainstorming sessions like these would lead to eventually lead to right answers. Uh, if uh, I'm not wrong, uh, Professor Susan. So uh, I think we are uh, moving towards that stage where we could have clear cut answers. And uh, yet it is so complex that uh, uh, things evolve every, uh, every other day. So uh, I think uh, that is what uh, should, should really, uh, the future really look like. So uh, I would like to just uh, ask you to share your way forward, your views on the way forward, the policy recommendations in short. Um, if you could briefly, ma'am. I don't have any policy recommendations on this, right? Because we're we're just this talk is about a metric that you know we are trying to get feedback on to use to assess you know where countries are as they move towards comprehensive data governance. I don't have any policy recommendations, and far be it from me to say anything to. Uh, Indian officials, but um, ask me about digital trade, <laughs> which India is not participating in at the WTO. Sure, I mean, if you could briefly uh, talk about that in, in a couple of minutes. Well, you know, India says, right, that its position is that data should be sovereign and um, while it does have some mechanisms for cross-border data flows, it doesn't want to agree to trade rules governing cross-border data flows. But um, more than half, I think it's 86 nations are participating in the joint statement initiative, which looks to govern cross-border data flows. And I just worry that they will come up with an agreement They've made significant progress. The ministerial is coming up in a couple of months, two months. And, um, you know, India, it would be good to have India participate, but India has decided not to, as has South Africa. But, you know, many developing countries are participating with varied levels of digital prowess. And so, it, it's important to have, Indi you know, India is still comments and um, I, I've done a paper on that and it is very interesting to see those comments. India's position both makes sense and doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, it's understandable that India wants to use the leverage that it has and its position that data should be sovereign. But on the other hand, 
these negotiations are really important. Sure, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now I would like to invite Anshula. Anshula, yes. Um, thank you. And uh, that was indeed a very uh, interesting discussion. And so as we come to the end of this deliberation, I would like to formally, on behalf of the IMPRI Generation Alpha Data Center, thank all of you for joining us today for this web policy talk. We are grateful to our speaker, Professor Susan Ariel Adamson, for taking out the time to be with us today and for delivering this very thought-provoking lecture, very uh, enriching uh, on comprehensive data governance, evolution, challenges, and the way forward for policy. Thank you, ma'am. We are grateful to Ms. Urvashi Prasad for joining us as a discussant and for adding her perspective to the deliberation. And thank you to all our viewers who joined us here on Zoom or on Facebook Live and raised such pertinent questions. And also, if you are watching later on YouTube or listening to us on our podcast. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you continue to tune in to future episodes of Data Discourses. I wish you all a very good evening and to friends in the USA a, a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.